Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Helen He from Nurse Training. Today uh, we're having the OpenMP training series session two on tasking. So this is a brief list of the task of the session topics. Uh, it's last it, it, it is a se series of seven sessions. Uh, today we're doing a session two, so you see the dates and, and topics. Uh, following is Neoma and SIMD and a guest speaker route on uh, what could possibly go wrong using OpenMP, then two sessions of OpenMP offload and remaining topics, such as hybrid MPI OpenMP, et cetera. If you missed session one, um, slides and exercises, recordings of session one are available on the event webpage. You can, can find them there and uh, catch up if you need it. Um, we're lucky to have two excellent OpenMP experts to give this training series to us. They're, they're in Germany, so especially um, appreciate it. I won't read through the slide again. Uh, we had we did that last time, but uh, yeah, you can um, see. I'll let it sit for a few seconds. So some logistics, um, everyone is muted right now. Uh, we would like you to change your name to last name, first name, so that we could um, have a record of who attended. And there's a CC button that you could turn on and off um, the, sorry, the captions and view full transcripts. Uh, we are recording this training, so feel free to unmute and ask questions during the tutorial. But if you are sh shy and prefer not to record your voice or face, uh, you can type question in Slack. We would either answer them in Slack directly or bring it to the live session. Um, we have up I have uploaded the session to slides and event webpage. Also, you will find the GitHub uh, link that have slides and exercises. Um, we have a, a Slack channel. We prefer Slack instead of Zoom for questions. So uh, I will put, put the Slack link again into the Zoom chat after my talk. There's also, if you are um, not a NERSC user, you have should have received an email on getting a promoter training account. It lasts for 10 days after today. Um, so generally, in, in general, if as long as you have uh, OpenMP, Compiler should be able to do exercise on your own machine as well. But Perlmutter, um, like the the slide exercise have been adapted to Perlmutter with Makefile and and Slurm batch scripts, so it's more convenient here. Then um, the training account for this session won't be valid for next session. So copy everything you need to your own machine before it is expired in ten days, please. Uh, we also prepared a survey for you to help us to improve uh, for our training OpenMP and in general. Please uh, take a few minutes to do that after the session. Um, code of conduct, we <clears throat> we, uh, we do team science, we trust you, so service, innovation, respect, and uh, we want us to be productively and professionally to do uh, our training and other NERSC activities. So if there's anything you would like to report, there's, you can write to nurse-training at lbl.gov, any concerns. Thank you. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Christian and Michael to with, go on with the official training. Um, it's still me and Michael or the other way around, Michael and uh, me. And uh, we are not going to introduce ourselves, but uh, uh, just as a reminder, so we work on the OpenMP Language Committee for quite a while. And that means if you have questions, you know, why things are the way they are, but also, of course, if you have questions on the material that we are presenting here right now, um, please feel free to ask. And uh, for, let's say, the, the um, reasons of privacy, if possible, via uh, Slack, uh, you can use a Slack channel to actually also ask anonymously. That's the idea. This is the, let me continue, the agenda uh, for today. So um, we want to start with a review of session one. We call it homework, but of course, these were assignments that uh, we invited you to work on. 
uh, work on. I will quickly run through the uh, solutions, and then uh, Michael will take over uh, with uh, the introduction to tasking, and then we go back and forth in between, covering all the important aspects of OpenMP tasking, and finally we will uh, conclude again or you know, close this session again with, if I remember correctly, three individual tasks. Uh, that we invite you to work on. So let me click. Sorry, there's a little bit of a lag here. Um, let me start the review with an open question for questions on your side. So is there anything that we should repeat review from session one? Solve any fundamental questions? Just giving the opportunity to bring this up. Going once, going twice. Okay, then let me uh, quickly go through the uh, solution of those homework assignments. If you look at the source code that's provided via Git, uh, there's also a folder named solution. And in that you will find exactly the code I'm going to show you. Uh, to be honest, I'm just showing you code snippets. And we provided the uh, solutions in C and C++ and Fortran. Here on the slides, I only have the C uh, solution. So task number uh, one was to complete uh, the Hello World in OpenMP, this famous piece of code. We had a very similar Hello World in the uh, course already. So what's happening here, we have to introduce a parallel region. Let me use a laser pointer, the parallel region that goes from line 28 to 34. And uh, we want to print hello from thread with a certain ID out of thread, uh, a number of threads, so and so. Uh, again, a certain number. And we're using the API routines OMP get thread num and OMP get num threads. Remember that in OpenMP, a team consists of the initial thread, that one has the ID 0 and uh, threads up to n minus one if we have n threads in total. So we should see something like hello from thread zero out of let's say four, hello from thread one, two, and three out of four. So if we have four threads, yeah, that will be the thread ID zero, one, two, and three. OMP get thread num and OMP get num threads return the corresponding numbers. If they're called from outside the parallel region, OMP get thread num will return zero, namely the ID of the initial thread, and OMP get num threads will return one. I guess it was simple. Uh, let me go, uh, go to the next task. There we asked you to parallelize an approximation of pi. I'm not uh, uh, going to details. Here we have a function called f yeah, that's not shown on the slide here, that's being evaluated. Um, and uh, the more often we evaluate it, the, the better the approximation of this very simple numerical integration approach will uh, become. So FH yeah, is the distance uh, between uh, the number of n integration points. I hope that's the correct term. And the solution is as follow. We evaluate all those, um, uh, or we execute all those evaluations of function f in parallel. Yeah? This is why we have the parallel. We apply the for work sharing to the following loop. That means the n number of n iterations are evenly distributed among the participating threads. Last time we also talked about load balancing, but here we do not have any load imbalance because every computation takes exactly the same amount of time. So they are of the same computational cost. Yeah? So the static Scheduling, this is what we called it last time, is the correct approach. But we have to take care of the scoping. That means to uh, define which variable or to declare which variables are uh, private, which ones are shared. So here we are seeing a private fx. That means this variable fx over here will be made private. Private means there's one instance of this variable for every thread participating in the team. And if you take a closer look, yeah, we are in this expression on the right-hand side of the assignment, fh is being read, and that's a constant. It's the same for every thread. But every thread is working on a different i, and, the con and in consequence, 
it's a it's a assigning meaning uh, defining fx with a different value. You know? If we would have only a single fx, that would lead to what we call a data race. So that means two threads would write different values to the same variable. One will go first, the other will go later, and that means we lose something in between. And this is why we have to make fx private. So every thread is writing uh, to its own copy or instance of this variable. This value is being read in here, uh, applied as an argument to function f, and the result is being added to f sum. We also have to deal with f sum, and we do not make it a private variable because private variables are being destroyed at the end of the parallel region. Instead, we make it a reduction variable. That means the compiler is doing the magic that we did manually last time. Well, not the magic, the code transformation we did last time. So it will make sure that there's f sum as a private variable for all participating threads in the parallel region. Initialized with a neutral element regarding this operation or the reduction operation, which is a plus, meaning the addition here. So the neutral element is zero. Then this private variable is being used in the computation. Uh, that means in the code construct shown here. And at the very end, all the private results from all the threads are being uh, combined to compute here the global sum taking all uh, yeah, partial uh, contributions and again, applying the reduction operator. If you would make this a private variable, yeah, I think I indicated this, the partial results would be gone because at the end of the parallel computation, all those private F sums will be thrown away, but we need it afterwards yeah, as shown uh, here. And there's a raised hand. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe this is obvious or not, but I'll ask anyway. So, uh, so FX is defined before the OMP region. Mm -hmm. So let's say you had four threads. So then when you enter this OMP region, I guess it'll create three more FX variables, mm -hmm. one for each thread. And then at the end, so does it just destroy three like random variables and leave one left or like how does, so, you know, you essentially quadruple your memory usage and then it gets destroys all three of them or, or all four of them or just three of them, um, essentially what FX is left over. Okay, so you can, uh, so you're right, FX has been declared before the parallel region. So it sits on the stack of this function calc pi. What technically is happening is that the body of the parallel region is being outlined yeah, that means the compiler generates a code construct, a code fragment that all the threads are able to call, and uh, that that means yeah, um, private copies of F sound will kind of sit on the stack that the threads have during the uh, course of the execution. Yeah, so but you don't have to worry about that. Uh, I think um, maybe just as a remark for C and C plus plus. If that would be a class, a variable of, of class type, the constructors would be called, of course. And here at the end yeah, of the parallel region, oops, here, the destructors uh, would also be uh, called, except for the, of course, initial one. Yeah? That, that remains to be there. Uh, that remains there because we have it here on the stack of this function calc pi. So it will be destroyed when calc pi is being um, completed. So those private copies will not remain, even though the threads might just be put to sleep. Yeah? But the memory is not wasted because they sit on the stack and will be destroyed. OK? OK, yeah, thank you. Sure, you're welcome. OK, if you want to try a few things, yeah, we don't have time for that. I can invite you to playing with what happens if, I, if you privatize fsum or not if you privatize fx or not, if you do not privatize fx, but increase compiler optimization and uh, look at all those effects. Yeah? Just to give you a hint, if you forget to privatize fx, but ask the compiler to aggressively optimize your code, it might eliminate this variable and then even avoid the data race, although the code yeah, contains a data race. But that is nevertheless incorrect code. 
according to both OpenLP and the base language. Uh, so this is not a recommendation to trust or uh, to rely on compiler optimization. Let me continue uh, with the Jacobi code that consists of two slides or two code snippets here. There was one <coughs> uh, called the initialization where we have, let me call them matrices U and F. These are being initialized and we have to par or we can parallelize the initialization as well. Although this is not really, let me call it a hotspot. Yeah? That means uh, it doesn't contain a lot of time. Uh, in about one month, we will talk about optimization for NUMA, and then it will be really important to do the initialization. So we will actually come uh, in initialization in parallel. Sorry. So we will come back to this example again uh, later on. Uh, the rest of that is simple. We have a parallel for that means the J loop is being parallelized. You could specify collapse two. That means the you would ask the compiler to collapse. Yeah, that means to fuse the loops uh, J and I, and that would extend the iteration space. Let's assume you do not know the dimensions of M and N, and one could be large and the other could be small. So that means combined, it would make sense to do the computation in parallel. But if you uh, out of luck and parallelize the J loop, but M is small and N is large, yeah, then performance speed up whatever could be uh, not optimal or limited. And uh, with collapse, you could avoid the situation by asking the compiler um, to consider both loops for the parallelization. And remember, this is only possible if these loops are independent. That means they spend a, or they create a rectangular iteration space. Again, privatization is important. We have to privatize XX and YY yeah, because they have been declared before the parallel region here in line 181. And we also have to privatize I, and this is overlooked pretty often yeah, because um, if we do not ask for collapse two, yeah, this is a loop that will be executed by every thread uh, performing the outer loop iterations. But since this is kind of C style code, I had been declared before the parallel region, so it means it would be a shared variable. That means we would have only one variable, and uh, then we would have a data race in I. Yeah? And you will see results are different every time you execute the code. So privatize I um, or use collapse. The uh, compute part, uh, I, I believe, ranging from line 85 to 112, yeah? again, is not really surprising. But it uh, um, could take a while uh, if you're new to OpenMP to come up with a solution. So we have a parallel region that's spanning the whole um, region of this code. Uh, that means it contains two loops. Yeah. This copying the new solution into the old one, yeah, like swapping the buffer. Um, so this is an OMP4 separated from the parallel. That means the parallel gives us a team of threads. The four is making use of this team and distributing the iteration, iterations of the J loop. And the same thing again, OMP4 is distributing the same loop, uh, the J loop to the team of threads. Yeah. Again, we have to privatize I, I explained that before, or we would do the collapsing. Here we also have to privatize a residual variable and we have to do a reduction with the plus clause on error. Uh, which is uh, this one here. Again, a good indication um, why reduction uh, is necessary for error instead of a privatization is that error is being read after the parallel region. And remember that the private variable is undefined or even thrown away after the parallel region. So I think technical questions are welcome in the Slack chat. Um, let me go to the final, oh, not, not we have the final task, the four uh, or work sharing uh, task. So here the question was, or you might have asked yourself the question, which loop shall I parallelize? This one in do some computation or the one in main? And um, many people just try it and then select the one in do some computation because it delivers a better speed up. However, now we would always uh, claim that it's more profitable to parallelize the outer level loops because then you avoid the overhead of going parallel, sequential, parallel, sequential uh, if you have parallelized the inner loop. 
the overhead is small, yeah, really, really small, but it's there. However, if you just parallelize the outer loop, here will you, ex you will experience a load imbalance because yeah, we iterate from zero to dimension, which is this, uh, 500, and pass this as an argument to do some computation. And then in this inner code, <coughs> excuse me, we iterate from zero to argument i times i, yeah, i to the power of two. That means for the first iterations of this outer loop, this is really cheap. For the last iterations of the outer loop, this is really expensive because we iterate to 500 or 499 times 499. If we do a static schedule, then we um, the loop iteration space of this I loop is distributed evenly. So um, a good solution is to use a dynamic schedule in which the loop iterations are distributed iteration by iteration to the threads whenever they finish their previous assignment. Uh, so uh, with this single uh, word, we can, um, oh, the, these two words actually, we can achieve a linear scalability on this particular code um, because the load, uh, the open MP runtime is distributing the work in a much better way. Again, the reduction on the result is necessary. And then finally, <laughs> we have this min max reduction. Yeah, so you see reduction is important for many codes. So it's appearing in several of our examples. Uh, we just wanted to illustrate that there's more than just a plus reduction operation uh, of operator. So we can have a minimum reduction and a maximum reduction. Um, uh, and that means uh, we can get even two results as reductions out of such a parallel for loop. You could also do that manually, uh, but uh, I think a clever solution is to use it uh, with OpenMP mechanisms as shown here. Just as a final remark, I think we have a slide in the last session on that. In OpenMP, you can also write user-defined reductions. That means reductions that work on your user-defined data types. Um, um, yeah, because reductions might not be available for that. Uh, the built-in reductions are available for all those plain data types that come with the base languages. This would conclude my summary of uh, the solution to the exercises. Uh, as I said before, there are source code solutions provided um, with, what, with our uh, handout or with what we distributed via GitHub. Uh, so that means you have uh, compilable and then hopefully also executable code already. Helen, is there any need to cover anything else from the exercises? Any other questions you guys have? Some of the questions in Slack have been answered. So. OK. So then let's start with today's topic, OK? I take this as a yes. So last time we talked about the parallel region, that means creating threads, the work sharing, that means distributing, in particular, that meant distributing loop iterations over the team of thread. And we talked about scoping, that means uh, defining, uh, declaring which variables are shared and which are private. And we talked about, to some extent, correctness, that means what is the data race and how to avoid that with synchronization like with critical. Today, yeah, I, we will ask you to do kind of a, let's say, mental turn. Yeah? Remember the parallel, but forget about the work chain for a moment, because we are introducing you the brave new world of uh, tasking, which is a different way of expressing uh, parallelism. So the, goal, the, the idea is, oops, then I start with a tasking motivation and show you one of the really important problems in uh, computer science for which there's no good solution uh, with work sharing available, namely solving Sudoku boards. So I hope you know what a Sudoku board is. Yeah? An example is shown here. We have to fill in uh, the, the, um, uh, the white fields, and uh, it's not allowed to have the same number twice in a row or in a column. Yeah? So there are clever algorithms. What we are doing is um, a very simple algorithm, uh, and we will exploit <coughs> parallelism uh, in order to speed that up. And let me make a statement here. Yeah, the, the code and the problem is very simple, but this pattern 
is really important. You will see it again later on. So finding in a graph um, or parallel searching in a graph, uh, parallel sorting, um, Fibonacci, and this all has the same pattern when it comes to OpenMP or expressing um, parallelism. So how is, does the algorithm work? Uh, it starts with an empty field, like the one in the top left corner, tries out all the numbers. That means it will put in, let's say, one, and then take a look. If this a candidate number, that means it's not there in a row or column. Here it is. Uh, so it will take the next number. But if it's a candidate number, it will take a copy of the board, put in the number, and then call the same algorithm again. So it's a recursive algorithm. That means it will continue with this number on the next field. This will end in some dead ends. Yeah? Then the recursion does a, what's the English term? Maybe backtracking yeah? or unwinding. I hope that's a correct term here. But this will evaluate all solutions or all possible um, uh, combinations and will find all the solutions. How can we parallelize this with OpenMP? Um, with what we have learned so far. Yeah, if you think about it, we do not have a large loop here. Yeah? So our loop goes from zero to six, uh, from one to 16. If we want to employ hundreds of threads as we have cores in current systems, scalability will be really limited. Yeah? And in addition, it's a recursive algorithm. So if we create call a parallel region from within another parallel region, yeah, we uh, create kind of an exponential number of threads, which will sooner or later overload every compute node. So it means we would also have to introduce mechanisms to limit the number of threads. This is not necessary with OpenMP tasking. So let me sketch the idea, then I'll hand over to Michael, who will introduce tasking, and we will come back to this example later on when we learned a little bit more. But let me sketch the idea because it really requires a slightly different way of thinking. So what we still need in OpenMP and up to the latest and greatest version of OpenMP, we always need, it, need this, and this is a parallel region. It gives us a team of threads, which will sooner or later execute the task. <clears throat> then we need a single. We learned about that last time already. So single means one thread will execute the body of this construct. The others will jump around and wait at the end. Uh, there's an implied barrier. Why do we need the single? Because we need one thread uh, to actually start with this empty field. There's no parallelism here at this first step of the algorithm. But then uh, when we create a copy of the Sudoku board with a, what I call the candidate number, we can evaluate this copy independently from all the other copies. Yeah, this is why we do a copy of the board. We take a copy of the board and let it spin off. Yeah, let's say for candidate number, what is it? Four, if I see that correctly. Yeah? And six, if I, no, not six, but seven, if I see that correctly. And that means yeah, for all the candidate numbers at this field, like four and seven, we can evaluate the rest of all those candidates and all the other empty fields also independently. So we have a recursive algorithm. As I said it before, it will take a copy and call the algorithm again. And we can do that in parallel. Uh, and this is what we do within task. So it consists of code, namely our algorithm, data, namely the copy of the uh, Sudoku board, and will be executed by a thread not necessarily the one executing the single, but we have the other threads waiting at the end of the single, and they will pick up this thread. So we need something in between, which is this pool of, um, of work. Yeah? We will come back to that later on. And just at the very end, we have to wait for the completion with a construct that we're going to take a look at later on. Sounds pretty simple. Yeah? So we will have millions of Sudoku board evaluations, uh, very simple code, and we parallelize something really complex, namely, a, uh, let me call it a divide and conquer, no, just a recursive algorithm, yeah? sorry. Uh, so we deparallelize the recursive algorithm. That means we can map this, uh, let me call it millions, or degree of parallelism in the order of millions to a handful or maybe two handful of threads. Yeah? And this is work done all by the OpenMP runtime. 
However, when we take a look at the speed up and performance evaluation, yeah, we will see there's room for improvement. So what we're seeing here on an admittedly a slightly old machine, maybe from 2013 or 2014, something like that. Yeah, we see in with the bluish bars uh, the actual runtime in seconds. Yeah? This is on the left-hand side of the slide. And then this grayish line is the speed up on the right-hand side of the slide. And throwing 32 threads on 16 physical cores at this problem gives us a speed up of, let's say, 3.7, which is clearly not, uh, let's say, 16 that we would uh, expect. And uh, this is also meant as a teaser yeah, to take a closer look if you just heard a little bit about tasking. So there's a little bit more to it in order to get good performance. But first, um, yeah, we will, we will come back to uh, uh, linear speed up later on. But first, oops, we need, we need to introduce uh, tasking in more detail. And I believe at this point, yeah, Michael is taking over. Yes. Um, so either I'm going to share and you stop sharing, or I have to say click about every two seconds. Um, depends on you what you want. Just do a click. I'll okay, all right, click. <laughs> all right, so hello, everyone, from myself as, as well. Uh, sorry for being muted. I'm uh, in Finland, actually, not in Germany this time, and I'm working from the hotel right now, so um, that's why I was um, staying silent for most of the time and videos turned off. Okay, so what is a task in OpenMP? That's probably the, the critical question that we need an answer for. So basically, um, with OpenMP tasking, you decompose uh, your problem, like the Sudoku board solving or you know any other algorithm that you can run in parallel, into concurrent units of work, which you may defer to someone else, another threat, or that you can execute immediately. And then it becomes a mapping issue from you know the the units of work that you create, Christian was mentioning millions of tasks for the Sudoku part, and you know you map them now to the available threads um, that are in your system to actually um, run them in in parallel and parallelize your problem. And typically, when you look at all those task-based progr programming models, so this is nothing special about OpenMP. A task usually is a piece of code that you want to execute. So, you know, a description of what the task is supposed to do, and then a data environment that is typ typically initialized when you create the task to basically describe what is the data that this code uh, should be working on. And then in kind of special to OpenMP, there's also so-called internal control variables or ICVs that are also attached to a task, but we can mostly ignore them. Uh, they play a certain role when you start exploring more advanced usages of tasks. All right, and then tasks in OpenMP are created when you reach a parallel region. So this, these are implicit tasks, one per thread. So anytime in the previous uh, tutorial or today, uh, Christian was talking about parallel creates a bunch of threads. Yes, that's true. But then the actual code running there is, um, is uh, considered an implicit task already. And that's a speciality that OpenMP had to do to basically marry the old uh, threat world with the more modern tasking world with OpenMP3. Then obviously when you encounter a task construct, that's when an explicit task is being created. We'll get to this in the next couple of minutes. And then there's a special construct called task loop that is for loop-based code. So you've seen the uh, Yacobi example before. So obviously there's a whole bunch of loops in there and we have a special construct to deal with that as well. And then we also have the target construct that is also a task in OpenMP language. Um, we'll cover that towards the end of the series, so after the summer break. Um, and But these are also tasks, and so you can talk to something like a GPU as well uh, from a task-based application. Click. All right, so why why do we need tasking? Well, I think the, the Sudoku example was already pretty motivating because it is kind of an irregular um, 
application because you don't actually know when the algorithm has to backtrack because it made a different choice. That depends on the field and the, the rest of the Sudoku that has, has already been filled in. But there are other patterns where traditional OpenMP threading is kind of a, a reaching a limit. And so for instance, here, if you have an unbounded loop where you cannot upfront determine what is the iteration space of the loop and how you can distribute that loop across the available threads, um, that is um, something where tasks come into play. Uh, we talked about recursion already. Um, and on the right-hand side, you actually see one of those unbounded loops. So, um, you know, we start um, Pragma OpenMP Parallel, then Pragma OMP um, Mask to basically say, you know, this while loop should be running in just one thread. And that thread is basically enumerating the linked list that I'm showing here. And for each element that this thread is enumerating, um, it spawns a new task to basically have the other co-workers of the team, the N minus threads uh, that are available, also execute that in parallel. Uh, you could also use single. So there's a bunch of different patterns how, how you do this but parallel mask or parallel single are kind of the most uh, common ones. And then, you know, the beautiful thing is that you can compose this like arp almost arbitrarily. So you can have, like I'm sh I was explaining already, a single creator. One thread is enumerating all the work for the others to pick up. Uh, you can have multiple creators. So you can run like a parallel work sharing construct, enumerating all the tasks that you want to create and then have uh, all the threads participate in the computation uh, and execute those tasks. And obviously you can also compose tasks in, comp in, in tasks. So that means once you are in a task, you can create more tasks um, as you see fit and as you progress, say through your recursive function um, and, and execute the algorithm. Click please. Uh, so here's the task construct. Um, this is all and everything that it has to offer. So we've talked about privatization. Uh, so you can have a task private variable. So basically an uninitialized copy. You can have a first private variable that's an initialized copy. You can share data. Uh, you can um, um, have a certain default for the sharing. Uh, you can pass in allocators. You can have detachable tasks. We'll probably cover that way at the end of the, of the series of tutorials. Uh, you can have uh, cutoff strategies. Christian will talk about this uh, in a minute. Uh, you can have task dependencies. I'll cover that uh, soon. And then you can influence how tasks are being scheduled via untyped, giving them priorities and affinities. Click, please. Um, okay, so tight versus untight. That's a bit of a strange thing to talk about because it's really, I think, special to how OpenMP works. Um, so basically a tight task is a task that is always executed by the same thread. It doesn't have to be necessarily the creator, um, but basically once a thread has started executing that task, it will finish that task and compute until its very end. The opposite of this is an untied task where basically you can have a task that starts execution on one thread. And then once that thread is uh, the task has been suspended and picked up again, it can be a different thread. Um, so why is that? Well, that's a, a thing, uh, Christian, please click. Um, that has to do with, um, you know, how o OpenMP works. So, you know, you can still see the OpenMP threads, right? So you can ask, for instance, in this example, foo, bar, and then in between, you may move the thread uh, to a different, um, uh, the task to a different thread uh, via the task yield construct. So when you do something like this, and in foo, you ask, what is the current thread executing this task? You can get a different, you will get the same answer for a tight task. So in foo, you'll get say 42, and in bar, because you have this guarantee that the thread uh, will not give away the task for some, uh, for somebody else to dis execute, uh, you will get the same answer. Christian, click, please. In the untied case, however, that answer might be different, right? So in foo, if you ask what is the current open MP thread, you'll probably get the 42 again. But then in bar, when you ask that same question, you probably get a different answer. And there are algorithms out there 
that require this um, to be the case, right? So that you get the same answer all the time you ask for the thread. Now, this probably is not necessarily something that you will write as a programmer, but under the hood, like internal structures of OpenMP, like, you know, if you take a lock and you want to release a lock, um, then you have to potentially stay on the same thread. And kind of if you do, if you um, use untied, you give OpenMP a guarantee that you're not doing anything that would be harmful, um, causing deadlocks or incorrect uh, program execution. And so that you give this additional freedom uh, to OpenMP uh, to do some scheduling. The downside, and that was actually written on the previous slide, is that most implementations do not honor the untied uh, uh, clause. Um, but still, you know, it's good habit to write it because if in the future your OpenMP implementation will support it, it can do something good for you in terms of uh, hopefully providing better performance and more scheduling flexibility. Click, please. All right, now we need to bring order into chaos to some extent. So, you know, all tasks that you create are running concurrently in any order. Right, there's no particular order that is introduced by the num the the order the how how you create them, or you know any other boundary conditions. If you create a task, it is you know put, sent to the pool and someone will pick it up, and they are picked up in any arbitrary order that is pretty much non-deterministic and depends on a on a whole bunch of conditions that are outside of your your control. So the question is now, how can we get you know um, some introduction of order into this execution chaos. Um, and one of these is task weight, where you can have, first and click please, uh, where you can have a parent task A, Christian, click, yep. So this is the parent task for click, um, a two tasks B and C, right? So now, if you want to make sure that the parent only completes if the two child tasks are also completed, we can introduce the task wait, which basically means that the parent task is waiting for all the children tasks it created to complete. And I think there's another click on that slide. Right. Um, what it doesn't do, though, so if there are grand children, like C is also the parent task of more tasks, C1 and C2, these are not part of the synchronization set of the task weight that is associated with task A. So this is really a direct relationship between parent and child, so that A will only um, wait for the um, direct child, but not all the further descendants, grand, 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 and grand, and so forth, children um, of, that, of that ancestry tree. Click, please. Another uh, synchronization is barrier. So here, the um, the thing is, we explained in the previous um, instance um, that barrier basically uh, um, sort of um, divides your uh, power region into two phases, the one before the barrier and the one after the barrier. And the one after the barrier is only executed when the first phase is already fully completed and all threads have reached that. And so this kind of, if you extend that to tasking, it kind of makes sense that tasks cannot cross that barrier. And that it, on in addition to what I just said, a per barrier only becomes permeable and continues with the code after it um, once all threat, all tasks in that in that first region have been before the barrier have been completed, and this is uh, true for all the implicit barriers, so the explicit ones that you put, but also the implicit ones at barrel sections, for single. So anytime there's a barrier, you have a guarantee that once you cross the barrier, um, all the tasks that have been created before the barrier have been completed. Click please. All right, now I said with task weight, that task weight is only um, waiting for the direct children. What if you want to wait also for the grandchildren and grand grand and so, and so forth, all the descendant tasks uh, in the ancestry tree? Well, this is where task group becomes handy. Um, so within the curly braces um, of the task group A, if you create tasks, regardless at which level and how deep in the ancestry tree uh, you do this, um, the task group will be a logical wrapper around all those tasks. And at the end of the task group, at the closing curly brace, 
that construct will wait for all the tasks that we've that have been created within the curly braces until they are uh, completed and uh, stopped execution. So this is where you can, you know, have a rather large set of of OpenMP tasks that you can wait for. Task group will have another role in in uh, in a minute, uh, plus in in future sections um, of this of this series of tutorials, it will also have more meaning. Click. All right. I already mentioned the data environment, click. Um, and so, you know, basically this is very, very similar to what you uh, heard from us uh, previously. So when you do task shared, the scope of A in the task is shared. So if other tasks have also shared A, they're gonna see the same A. It's really similar to what you heard about um, when Christian was talking about threading uh, previously. When you do private B, uh, the scope of B will be private. So that task that you just created will have its own very own task local copy that no other task can can see um, of that of that variable. And first private is uh, the same thing essentially, but now we take um, the value of C, in this case of the parent task and copy it into the private variable inside the task so that you can use it there. Click. Uh, if you have a default clause, it is whatever the default clause says, right? So you can have task default shared. So anything that you ex don't, do not explicitly mention in private and first private will be shared. Um, if you put default none, which is sort of the recommendation, even though it's a bit to write for every task construct, then the compiler uh, basically will force you to specify the scope of every variable that you use in, in the context of the construct. And so it kind of forces you to basically think about proper data sharing, uh, enumerate all the data that you want to be um, shared, private and first private. And it will also avoid a bunch of nasty surprises that you can that you, that you can see um, when refactoring your code. Click, please. Okay, and then, you know, um, as usual, OpenMP has kind of a default set of rules how um, the compiler automatically um, infers a proper meaning of variables. So I'm, um, you know, we don't have to necessarily go through all of them. But basically, if you have a global variable with thread private, um, that global variable is going to be thread private in a task. And like we said um, previously, and um, at any OpenMP tutorial we're giving, don't use global state um, in terms of file scope variables static variables inside a function body like in four um, or safe variables if you're a Fortran programmer, either in modules or uh, procedure procedures uh, because they are kind of um, weird for the compiler and they kind of are counterintuitive when it, when you talk about uh, parallelization. Now, if you have a static int or a safe variable inside an OpenMP task, that is automatically shared because it's basically, you know, um, shared across all the threads and it's also going to be shared across all the tasks. Uh, then number two to talk about pointers and we had a similar questions uh, question in um, in Slack already. So if you do uh, P equals some memory allocation, um, P um, may be subject to one of these um, predetermined data sharing attribute rules or the explicit data sharing that you saw on the previous slide. But regardless of what you do with, with the pointer, so even if the pointer is first private, for instance, the memory behind that pointer, so the stuff that you actually got back from malloc, um, that is going to be, sh be shared, which we indicate on this slide with star p. Um, and then, you know, finally, if you have this, you know, static variable in foo, um, then um, you know um, it is it is going to be shared because by calling through from the task um, you kind of um, automatically see that as a shared variable. Click please. Okay, so in practice, um, it is it sort of makes sense, and we we took great care in open MP, in the open and PRB so that it's not causing any big surprises. So if you have something that is already shared, it kind of makes sense to keep sharing it 
between the OpenMP test that you create. If it is not shared, the variable's first private, because then the assumption is um, that when you have a single variable that um, it is, that is say private in the in the outer scope, uh, and when you start creating new new tasks uh, um, and you use that variable inside a task, then you know it, it is cut probably a, a proper assumption that you want to make it private to begin with. And then, you know, also making it first private so that you get the original value kind of makes sense because that is kind of a very um, smart way of, you know, moving data into, into a task. Click, please. All right, so this is actually a um, something that you can work through as part of the homework assignment. So click, click through that slide, please. Um, I don't wanna make this interactive, um, that's, that works better in a face-to-face -face, um, tutorial, click. Okay, now task reductions. So you heard about reductions quite a bit uh, previous session, but also today when Christian was going through the um, solutions. Um, when you have a task-based program, you probably also wanna do reductions. And the way this is done is via the task group feature um, so you you heard that it's waiting for all the tasks that are created from within a task group. And so because it already has this waiting thing at the end of the task group construct, it almost feels like a task barrier, if you allow that um, fuzzy term. Um, and so we could use that waiting at the end to basically implement a reduction. And this is actually, actually what we do. So when you write OpenMP task group task reduction, uh, similar to the regular reduction clause, you basically tell the task group and the compiler um, to basically turn this task group into a task group that has the ability to reduce a value according to the operation you specify on the variables that you specify at the end when it is waiting. And inside the task group, you can mark a task that is contributing to this reduction um, with the in underscore reduction clause, specifying again the same operation that you had at the task group and the list of variables that you also had in the task group. And so now what it does is basically anytime that task finishes, it basically contributes or open and P the compiler in the runtime system basically takes that value that the task has computed and adds it on top of the task reduction that you created with the task group construct. And why we had separated this um, is that in a task-based program, you may also have tasks that are not supposed to contribute to the task reduction. And so you can, you can have those tasks by simply not using the in reduction clause at all. All right, click. Uh, click that one because that's, that's probably too deep. All right. Let me talk about um, tasking illustrated. So how does this actually work under the hood? Click please. All right, so here's um, a bit of a clumsy way to calculate uh, the Fibonacci numbers. So um, there's a loop form of this and there's also a closed uh, form of this, uh, but pretty much, you know, let's just assume this is a recursive algorithm and it's a little uh, smaller than the actual Sudoku example. Um, so, but, you know, it is small enough so that we can, we can convey what is going on. So in the first syntax box on the left, what we do is we spawn a parallel team. So we have N threads available. The next step we do is, and this is the common pattern in, in task-based programs, as, as I already explained, we pick one arbitrary thread out of those N threads to basically kick off recursion by calling fib on the input variable. And then inside that function, as long as we have to recurse into, into the Fibonacci algorithm by Fibonacci n minus one and Fibonacci n minus two, we basically you know, create a task for each branch in the recursion. So we create a task to compute Fibonacci of n minus one and assign it to x. We create a new task for Fibonacci n minus two and store that into y. And then obviously, because we want to sum up x plus y and the end, uh, we have to do a task weight so that by the time we hit the return statement, we know that the x task and the y task have actually finished their computation. 
So the parent task that is uh, evaluating that level of the recursion will have to wait for the two children task. And then, you know, X and Y are by the definition of the um, data sharing attribute rules that I just explained are private variables because they are inside the function body um, declared inside the parent task currently executing that level of recursion. Um, so these are private variables. And so we have to make X and Y shared variables for the two child tasks so that they share X and Y with the parent task and can actually modify it. Click please. All right, and so what happens? So, you know, if you have T1, uh, say, entering Fibonacci of four, now, Christian, you're going to uh, hit the keyboard hard. Um, what it does is it creates the Fibonacci N minus one task, so Fib of three plus an N minus two task, that is Fibonacci two, click. And then, you know, some other threads like T1 and T2 basically pick that out of the task pool and start executing this. And now on that level of the recursion, um, we're going to add, um, you know, T1 is going to execute Fibonacci of one, uh, of two and one, so n minus uh, one and n minus two. And so at that level, we already have four, threat, uh, four tasks available. And if we have T1 to T4 as the threads available for executing tasks, we can pick those up and schedule them. And this continues until we basically hit the, um, the termination condition of the recursion, at which point we basically just return um, the right Fibonacci number for one or zero. All right, click once more, please. Okay, loops, click. All right, so let's say you have something loopy where, you know, in the previous um, session or um, in the in the solution part, uh, you used parallel four or the four work sharing construct with an existing parallel region. Now, if you want to run this on OpenMP tasks, you can actually do this. And this is a, a very simple code transformation. So basically what the middle um, um, box on the, on the uh, left-hand side shows is, uh, the outer loop enumerating with uh, a step width of TS, and TS is short for tile size. So that is a loop that basically enumerates a larger chunk, larger chunks of the loop. Pretty thim similar what word sharing would do uh, for a, let's say, a dynamic uh, schedule of a certain chunk size. Um, we are enumerating those chunks, uh, in this case, of TS size. And then the inner loop basically runs from the beginning of one of those chunks to the end of one of those chunks and does the original algorithm inside that loop chunk. Um, and what we also have is this UB. So we basically need to make sure that we have proper remainder handling at the end so that you know we don't overshoot to, towards over the end of the original loop iteration space um, in case uh, the tile size doesn't evenly divide uh, the, um, the size of our arrays. And then once we have done this code transformation, what we can do is we can go back to the parallel single pattern. So create a number of threads, restrict to one execution uh, thread, and then X have this uh, thread enumerate um, the tiles. So run the outer loop. And then for each tile, have that thread create a new open MP task. And we have to do a bunch of privatization so that the loop variable is private, that uh, the I and the UB that we feed in are first private. That's actually a performance optimization. We could leave that at shared. And then obviously the pointers S, A, and B in this case are shared. We could also make those first private if we really want it. Okay, so I said this is a simple code transformation and hopefully you believe me. Um, but it is cumbersome. So in you know, in like a three-line loop, like I'm showing here, this is absolutely possible. You can see everything on one screen. Uh, you don't have to rena rename too many loop indices. So it's all fine. If you have, however, a larger code where this loop is not just one line, but like a thousand lines, um, this becomes complicated. Right, and so in this case, you want OpenMP to do this rather co mechanical code transformation, and this is where task loop comes in. And so when you prefix the original loop with pragma on task loop, you pretty much get something that is very similar 
uh, to what I showed, except that the uh, Pragma on parallel single is not added by default. It's just the, you know, the original loop being enumerated and loop tasks being created. Click, please. All right, so this is a task generating construct. It's kind of a hybrid between a tasking construct. So it basically inherits uh, a whole bunch of the um, clauses that we also have for the task construct. But it also sort of is, is, is a kind of a work sharing construct. And it also in, uh, inherits a bunch of these things like the collapse clause um, or the allocate clause. And uh, for controlling how large the chunks are that you cut, it has a special set um, of clauses, grain size and num test. Click please. Okay, this this I will let see, let uh, sink in for like thirty seconds. So on the one on the left hand side, you see the work sharing version of this. So the idea is um, this code creates sixteen threads. It then runs a loop with ten twenty four iterations, and for each iteration, it basically counts if that iteration was run. Um, and on the right hand side, I show the same code, but now I use task loop. Um, and so um, I'll let you think about if these two things are actually computing the same thing uh, for like 20 or 30 seconds. All right, that's probably 20 seconds. Um, click, please. Christian. All right, so left hand side, that's probably what you would expect, right? If you distribute 10, 24 iterations across 16 threads, each of the threads uh, gets like 64 um, elements or iterations to compute on. We count all those. Uh, and then we print the results. So basically we have executed a loop of 10, 24 iterations on 16 threads. On the right hand side, you see a different result. It actually prints 16,384. That's probably not what we wanted, right? So somehow it's it looks like that the loop was running 16 times. And this is actually what happened. So in this code on the right hand side, we create 16 threads. And then the task loop construct um, is executed by 16 threads, right? Um, but the key difference here is it's not like splitting up the loop across those 16 threads, but each of the 16 instances of the task loop are running concurrently and then are further splitting up uh, those 16 instances of the same loop. And that's why this code actually prints uh, 16,384, which is exactly 16 times 1024. So click, please. If you want to turn this and click once more, please, um, into a work sharing loop that actually takes the 1024 loop iterations and distributes them across 16 threads instead of running the loop 16 times in 16 threads, um, you have to prefix the task loop with pragma on single so that, you know, you basically create 16 threads. You have one thread encountering the task loop. That one thread starts splitting the loop and then assign uh, you know, the loop chunks uh, to the 15 uh, left threads um, and execute that in parallel. Click, please. All right, there's two ways um, to basically specify how you want to um, um, have the loop chunks being cut. Um, so the first one is a grain size. So you basically specify the minimum um, number of iterations that you want per loop chunk, or you can specify the number of tasks that you want to create. Um, and then the compiler will basically pick a loop uh, chunk size that fits that um, requirement. Click please. Okay, collapse, uh, we talked about this. So basically you can take uh, two loop nests or you know, a loop nest and basically collapse a whole bunch of loops so that you get more iteration space that you can then uh, assign to loop chunks, click. 
And of course, we can have uh, task reductions with task loop as well. So there are two flavors of this. So if you have Pragma on task loop as kind of its own construct uh, with a parallel loop that you want to reduce um, some certain value, you can just use reduction like you would use uh, with a standard work sharing construct. And task loop, click please, has this additional flavor of that it may contribute to a task reduction. So here I'm showing that I'm opening a task group that has a task reduction on plus and then task loop in reduction, which basically means the tasks that are resulting from the loop are now contributing to the task reduction um, that was, was created earlier. And now you can mix and match this with regular tasking as well. So you can have a task group with a task reduction and have some loop, some task being created by task loops uh, contributing to the reduction result and some other um, regular tasks also being created that contribute to this uh, task group um, result. Click please. Okay, there's a composite construct called task loop SIMD. We didn't talk about SIMD um, yet. So basically this is another way of um, um, specifying that, you know, a loop chunk should be further subdivided into SIMD reg vector registers in this and be executed using SIMD instruction. We'll get to this um, when we talk about SIMD. Click please. Which is, which is next time. Yes. Thank you. Okay, now task dependencies. Um, okay, so I already said that all, all the open MP tasks are kind of arbitrarily executing. And so the question is how can we get some order into this? And so here what I'm showing is an example where you know one task is basically outputting X on the console and then another task is executing um, or modifying that, that, um, that task, uh, that, that variable. Now, the thing is, if you want to make sure that the right value is printed, you have to make sure that the blue task is executing before the red task. And so what, with what I explained so far, you would put in Pragma OpenMP task wait construct to basically make sure that the first task is finished before the second starts execution. Now, this works in this case, and it's just great. Stop clicking, Christian. <laughs> Um, so in this case, it, it just works. But if you had another task that is completely unrelated to all this, it would also synchronize with the red task. And this is not, now click please. This is where task dependencies come in because now you can describe that dependency between the first task, the blue one, click once more please, um, and the red task by basically saying, only those two tasks, they have a certain relationship in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain sense that there's an input dependency for X on the blue task. So this task is somehow consuming an existing X and then the red task has an in out dependency. So it wants to consume X, modify it and store it back so that you uh, open MP now knows that the blue task has to compute before the red task. Click please. Click. All right, so give me, let me give you a more a fancier example about this. So this is Cholesky factorization, more of a HPC algorithm. And so this is kind of already kind of a blocked version of this. So all the, um, the operations that we do are already on matrix sub blocks. And so what happens here is that, you know, when you look at this, you can do a, t, a triangular solve um, for you know um, a part of the or, or the matrix, and you can do all those blocks in parallel using TSRM, so that becomes a task. And then when you update the trailing matrix, you have to do DGEMs and rank updates, and all those can also be done in parallel. But then before you switch from triangular solve to trailing matrix update, you have to put a task weight. And if you want to switch back from trailing matrix to um, diagonal block factorization and triangular systems, you also have to put a task weight. And that gives you a chart that roughly looks like this in the execution pattern, where you have kind of lockstep between purple, blue and red, purple, blue and red, and in between you have those task weight constructs introducing a barrier. Click. Now, if we can describe to the system, what is the relationship between um, the individual tasks and the data that they're working on. What we can do is we can 
completely remove the task weight and basically say, you know, TSRM is using the KK block of A and it is reading the KI block does something to it using the KK block and then stores it back into the KI block. Down where we do the DCHIM, we can describe how the data is flowing through DCHIM. So meaning that, you know, uh, DCHIM is reading the KI block, which I just mentioned is an output of the TSRM, the AKK J block and the JI block, and it produces a new version of the JI block. And if we do this, click please, we can now order the task as part of their um, way the data is flowing through um, the operations they perform. And so now, instead of having this lockstep behavior, we can actually um, you know, model the data that is flowing and we can even add Potter F, so the diagonal block factorization as another task into the system, giving us more parallelism because now we can you know, also describe um, how the, the data that is uh, coming from this operation is basically flowing into the, uh, the rest of the algorithm that we already had taskified. Click, please. All right, does it improve performance? Yes, it can perform, improve performance because now we, we have more parallelism. We have this additional yellow task and we can also start pulling tasks that have data ready. We can pull them into the execution schedule early on and basically hopefully reduce the critical path lengths um, through the system. Click please. All right, um, I would suggest to basically skip over that um, and continue with cutoff strategies because that's just you know the explanation of all this in more detail and a bunch of things that we probably don't want to talk about at this point. Okay. Well, I click too often PowerPoint stop. You want to go through the use case? Yes, please. Okay, so here's another use case. So this is um, gauss Seidel, um, which basically is one of those stencil operations that um, you see quite frequently in HPC algorithms, click. Okay, so this is the pattern. So um, so basically, you know, in, in, in the middle of the cross, that's the cell you update. And so you read a new value and an outdated value. So the new value is dark green and the outdated value is a light green, click. So if you want to parallelize this, this is a typical way for parallel execution. So uh, just click a bunch of times um, so that people can see the pattern. So if we have computed the upper corner, uh, the wave progresses into the first uh, diagonal and then to the next diagonal and, and so forth. And within each diagonal, we can nicely parallelize, but we cannot parallelize across uh, the different um, diagonals. Click, please. So this is the algorithm um, that does this. Uh, click. Uh, oh, sorry, go back once more. Sorry, I thought there was an animation. Okay, so basically what it does is um, it basically enumerates uh, all the diagonals. So this is the uh, four diac loop. And then within each diagonal, it basically does a parallelization. Uh, it reconstructs the I, I, and J that is reconstructing the original matrix block inside that diagonal. And then inside that matrix block, it basically um, runs the original gauss seidel algorithm um, to compute the result of that of that block. And so, you know, the first half of the code that I'm showing on this on this slide actually is um, the first half of the diagonals, um, and then uh, at the end, you know, we have this teardown loop that basically runs through the last NB diagonals. So basically, you you have to think about this um, code being there like twice. Now click, please. Now if we if we observe the original data pattern again, click, click. Um, what we can do is, you know, once we have computed enough into the into the solution grid uh, by doing a, a couple of wave steps, we can actually start the next wave, right? So in this case, um, we can we can start the blue wave 
because the green wave has progressed enough into the into the grid. And once the blue and green wave have been uh, in the grid um, already, uh, we can start another wave, the red wave. So we can, even though we cannot compute, you know, multiple, um, like I said, we cannot compute multiple waves in parallel easily with multi-threading. But if we have, if we would have a pattern where, if we knew that we are already far along in the grid enough, so that we can start the next iteration, we can add additional parallelism um, into the system into the algorithm. Click. So this is the idea, right? So it's pretty much again the same block version of the code that I was showing for multi-threading. But now, click, please. What I can describe to the system click is that you know each of the matrix blocks click has a certain dependency to other blocks of the solution grid. Okay. And this is what I'm showing here. So basically I'm enumerating all the dependencies in out. So that's the middle block and the input dependencies, that is the block to the left, to the right, to the top, and to the bottom. Um, once I enumerate all those, the open MP system. Uh, knows in which order to execute all those uh, tasks that are resulting from this algorithm. And so in that case, what we can easily do is we can, you know, just create all the tasks and let OpenMP sort out in which order it has to run those ways. Click, please. Okay. Why did I choose the whole block? This is a bit over specifying the, the actual dependency, but it makes it a lot easier. Um, it doesn't really matter in this case. Um, because the block size in this case is two by two, I can easily uh, depend on all of the block and not just the halo cell of the current block. Um, you can you can look at this um, in your own stencil algorithm, and I guess you will easily find that you can do a very similar pattern um, than this. Click, please. So does it pay off? It depends. So the red curve, that's the traditional word sharing loop that I was showing with the diagon explicit diagonalization of the problem. And in the beginning with low numbers of threads, it is actually faster, right? But at some point, because after each wave, we have to do an implicit barrier after the word sharing construct, synchronization becomes more and more costly. And so it basically reduces the available parallelism. Plus we have this, tear up, um, um, start up and tear down overhead where we don't have enough parallelism to um, saturate all our threads. Um, and so in the end, you know, all this together basically shows that the OpenMP dependency version using OpenMP tasks actually scales better and provides more speed up um, than the um, native threading version. Click please. All right, skip that uh, to cutoff features. We are really running behind schedule. All right, thank you. Back to you. Okay, so let, let me uh, take over again. Um, so in the beginning, I I, I promised that I will come back to uh, this. Yeah? And uh, by now you understand what's behind task and uh, task weight. So uh, let me just remind you, we are executing, uh, executing the remaining evaluation of all the Sudoku bores in parallel. But yeah, the performance was below expectations. So the speed up was really uh, limited. So before just uh, uh, giving away the solution, yeah, let me explain how uh, we, we actually, many years ago, we found out what's going on and uh, how you could also do that uh, for your code, although this is behind, uh, be, yeah, this is um, beyond the scope of this OpenMP tutorial. So we use performance analysis tools, and there are many out there. And I'm not going to make a statement on which one is good and which one is not good. We were just using um, an infrastructure named Score P that uh, we used to actually monitor the behavior of the program. We call um, uh, we created a trace and then uh, presented it in profiles. And uh, we were using Scalaska and Vampire to actually visualize uh, this. So this is uh, Scalaska showing a profile. So we statistically, uh, we have seen uh, statistical information. This is our program. And we are seeing here uh, individual OpenMP threads executing 
each one about 1.3 million tasks during the execution of the whole program in, let's say, about 5.7 or 5.8 seconds. And that means the average duration of a task is just 4.4 microseconds, which is really not much. Yeah. Now I'm using the same data, but showing it for a different uh, tool. Uh, this time, this is uh, Skalavska giving me a graphical representation. Here, I'm showing the recursion levels. Yeah, and the recursion level six, I just selected one task, which took about 0 0.16 uh, seconds at level 48, yeah, an individual task, oops, is down to 0 0.001 second. And at level 82, the tool is telling me this is uh, a task is taking about 2.2 microseconds, but don't trust performance tools at this resolution. Yeah. There's a lot of measurement overhead already uh, involved. So what's the issue? I'll just go back to, sli oops, to slides. When we start here, oh, oh, I hope you can see it. I hope you can still see it. Sorry, the Mac was doing um, unexpected things. In this upper left corner, if we take a candidate number, put it into the Sudoku board and go on with the asynchronous evaluation, if I may say so, this is a uh, fat task yeah, because it, evaluate, it contains the evaluation of all the candidates and all the other numbers. But we're kind of splitting this task up or more precisely, this task is generating more tasks uh, for all the candidate numbers and all the other included boards, uh, at, at all the other empty fields. Yeah. We go through the board row by row but if we finally end up in here, uh, first, most of the fields are already taken. Uh, so that means the number of candidates is rather small. And second, there are only very few empty fields left. So that means these tasks are first very small and second, create even smaller tasks. And this is what I was showing you in the performance tools. Yeah? at the, the corresponding begin and end of a task becomes smaller and smaller or closer to uh, closer together if we took at the time if we look at the timeline view of the program and uh, do we really need 10 million tasks for eight threads uh, the answer is probably no i mean the real answer is always it depends when it comes to performance and scalability but here we have more tasks than we need to get all those eight threads or even uh, 16 or 32 threads busy or even 100. Yeah? So it means when we have expressed enough parallelism, we have to stop creating more tasks. What is, I mean, how many tasks are enough tasks? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, this really depends on the problem science and the number of uh, threads and so forth. But the rule of thumb is that you need at least 10 times more tasks than you're going to exploit threads. Yeah? If you have those tasks and if they are more or less of the same computational cost, the OpenMP runtime can do a good job in most cases of getting all those threads busy. Yeah? Some more tasks um, uh, make sense. Yeah? That's not an issue. But at some point, we have ex uh, expressed enough parallelism to really exploit all the threads. Yeah? That means uh, good, put them to good use. And creating even more tasks, in particular smaller and smaller tasks, just uh, adds parallelism. So what we have to implement is something that is called a cutoff. That means we stop creating more tasks. We will do so with, an, uh, in particular, the if clause in OpenMP, but there's more to it. And if we do so, this is what we get. Oh, Michael, we still use the old version of the figure with the wide runtime. Yeah, so that, that means the runtime is slower, although you can't see it. Um, but the, um, the speed up uh, is approaching 16. I said this was a machine using hyperthread, so we are exploiting a speed up of, or getting a speed up of 16 on 16 physical threads. If you take a close look, yeah, there's a gap in the line here at four seconds, no gap in the line of five seconds. So we can guess and actually we know that the sequential runtime is between four and five seconds. 
That means even for a single thread, and the same is true for two threads, we have a, not only a speed up, yeah, but also a slower uh, runtime. And this is because uh, we save a lot of overhead because even for a single thread or two threads, yeah, we, uh, we have fewer tasks and in this particular application. That means we have a, a fewer number of copies of the Sudoku board that have uh, that has to be um, created. Mm -hmm. So how to implement that in OpenMP? Well, there's the if clause, which is kind of a uh, switch off mechanism. We can put this to a parallel region and it takes an a Boolean expression uh, as, uh, yeah, as shown here maybe, or as shown here as an argument. If it's on a parallel region and the expression evaluates to true, you get the parallel region as you know it. If it evaluates to false, the parallel region will be executed with a single thread only. If you put it onto a task and you get it true, the task will execute as you know it. But if it if this expression evaluates to false, the task will be executed immediately. It will not go onto this pool of tasks to be picked up sooner or later. So technically we call that the encountering task. Yeah? That means the task around will be suspended yeah, because this new task will be executed immediately. Of course, task dependencies are still being respected and so forth. However, yeah, there's still a data environment being created. That means if we have a private variable on this particular task, then we get this additional variable. Uh, that means there's still an overhead um, of some extent. Yeah, because otherwise the code would be uh, the the value, or the, sorry, the result of the code could depend on the result of the evaluation of the if clause, and this is not what you want. Okay. So this is useful for debugging, yeah, but this is also good for performance. If you know that you want to do implement a cutoff, yeah, there are two more things that can improve performance, at least theoretically. I will come back uh, to that uh, comment in a second. The first call, uh, the first uh, clause that can be put onto a task is called final. This also takes an argument, and again. Uh, if the expression evaluates to false and this argument, then uh, nothing special happens. But if it evaluates to true, yeah, the runtime will assume that this one is the final task. Yeah, if you think of a task in the program as a tree, it would be the leaf task because all subsequently encountered tasks shown here as B and C tasks, referring to the earlier example, would be included. Yeah, that means executed immediately. So this would say uh, here, I'm finally ending uh, the recursion, still honoring the data sharing clause. That means creating um, uh, data regions. If you know that you don't need this data region, and you have to assure that as a programmer that there's no unintended side effect. That means uh, in many cases, it's a difference if the value would be shared or private. Uh, but if you know that you do not need it, you can tell that by specifying the mergeable clause. And that means if you would have included task, tasks with a mergeable clause, they would completely go without any um, overhead uh, because they would be executed immediately without any uh, data region being uh, created. However, now the, for the bad news, the if is implemented, but final nor mergeable are uh, making a real difference in most commercial uh, implementations. Yeah? That might be no, no longer true with final for Clang or with the next release of Clang. I haven't seen anything for uh, regarding mergeable, but again, I might have overlooked that, uh, but don't expect too much. However, yeah, if it's there, and uh, if you look at uh, other codes, we will discuss it uh, probably next time when discussing the solutions. Uh, if you want to avoid the overhead of if and uh, creating a data environment, then it would be possible to do this manually in the code. That means implementing the same mechanism just in native C, C++, or Fortran code. Okay, and with that, yeah, this complete concludes our lecture for today. I think we're also at the end uh, of the scheduled time. Just a 
uh, give me a session, uh, give me a few seconds to explain uh, the hands-on exercises. So we again yeah, provide them via GitHub. There's a Slurm script to uh, run it on your system. And uh, there's again a folder named solution. So this time uh, we prepared three exercises execute, uh, meant to be executed on the second day, whatever that means. Of course, uh, we want to say that this relates uh, to this chapter. The first one is called Fibonacci. Yeah. So Michael showed you uh, uh, quickly how to parallelize Fibonacci result maybe tasking. Here the goal is to try um, to repeat it on your own. Yeah. Then uh, there's a four or the work distribution example from the previous um, exercises. I was showing you the solution with schedule dynamic before. Now it's your task to transform this code uh, into a task parallel version. You can create two different versions, one employing the task, the other construct, the other employing the task loop construct. And finally, there's quicksort, yeah, which is again a recursive algorithm. So you can employ tasking and implement a cutoff. And if you want to take a yeah, look at other codes, of course, quicksort is not very efficient in parallel. There could be merge sort and others, but uh, uh, we believe this is uh, sufficient to familiar, familiarize yourself with OpenMP tasking. And with that, I think it's our time to stop talking here and hand over back to Helen. Very good timing. Um, I just want to quickly add about exercises. So you see the exercises uh, in the session two um, Git repo directory. Um, there's also uh, the uh, instructions, exercise OMP 2024.pdf, and uh, the ways how do you make, how do you compile and run. There's also um simple Slurm script that you could ask batch that's already adapted to the parameter script. If not, you could also do um, just dot executable name and um, directly with an interactive batch session. But we do, I don't want to emphasize, try different number of OpenMP threads to see the scaling effects. So it's also doc, it's all doc documented in these um, instruction PDF. But also we, uh, in the session section one uh, directory, there's a, a talk I gave last time on using various uh, OpenMP compilers on, on Perlmutter. The default is GNU compiler, but there's a way to, to use different compilers, Intel and Cray compiler, et cetera. And there's also an explanation of the batch script. So use that as, as a reference as well, please. Um, so for that um, session ends right now, I put the survey link in the chat. Please take a few minutes to do that. Uh, we we really appreciate your feedback. And, and thank you so much for attending the session. Um, next session will be, I think, July 8th. So we'll send you um, a sub, another calendar invite and training accounts information. And lastly, thank you so much, Christian and Michael. Uh, You're welcome. Your time and with prepare slides, prepare exercises. So, and I think we all learned a lot, uh, truly expert.